As she walks to her room, she notices the maids lined up in front of her door. This is quite unusual, so she asks them why they're gathered there. Half-jokingly, she wonders if they're planning to ask for a raise, but one maid steps forward and explains that Duke Viserk has sent her a collection of gifts, and they're here to help unpack them. Curious, she smiles and tells her maid to start opening the packages. The first box reveals a stunning dress from the capital's hottest designer. Her maid, astonished, points out that even with a reservation, one would usually wait three years for such a piece. Impressed, but not wanting to get too excited yet, she moves on to the second box. Inside, she finds exquisite artisan earrings with brilliant cuts. The third box holds a bouquet of roses and a rose-scented perfume. Each gift seems more impressive than the last, and she continues opening them with growing anticipation. Finally, she reaches the last box and discovers a shiny ruby bracelet. The maids gasp in awe, admiring the luxurious piece and remarking on how much Duke Viserk must care for Princess Llewellyn. As she stands there, she muses to herself that nothing expresses love better than jewelry. She wonders how much trouble the Duke went through to buy these gifts and predicts the rumors that will soon spread across the kingdom. Then, she notices a letter attached to the final gift. After reading it, she suspects the Duke is being so generous because he feels indebted after losing his virginity. Just as she considers returning the gifts, a troubling thought crosses her mind. Could Empress Pamela and Duke Viserk be conspiring to keep her at the palace or force her into marriage? Is the Empress trying to trap her in a marriage with the Duke to keep a closer watch on her and make her miserable? Reflecting on her future, she remembers that in a few years, she will be 25 and able to join the monastery. With renewed determination, she vows to reach the Holy Land and stay true to her goal, refusing to let anyone sway her from her chosen path. In the next scene, a grand convoy of carriages rolls into the village, making everyone curious about who this important visitor could be. When Princess Llewellyn steps out of her carriage, she instantly captures the attention of the villagers. She proudly announces herself as Princess Llewellyn Avon Brigant of Brigant, and promises to show them hospitality on behalf of the king and the duke. As she walks among the villagers with her knights, a murmur spreads through the crowd, if this is really Llewellyn, then she must be the daughter of the executed queen. Princess Llewellyn orders Commander Tristan to prepare the supplies, revealing that she plans to give away the gifts the duke had given her. Tristan hesitates, asking if she really wants to use Duke Viserk's presence this way. She firmly replies that if even he, a knight, knows about the Duke's gifts, then the Duke must have made quite a show of it. When Tristan, still concerned, asks if she dislikes the presence, she confirms it. She adds that returning them to the Duke would mean nothing, but giving them away will annoy him even more. After a long day of accompanying the princess, the other knights talk about going home, but they can't help but notice how hard the princess is working. They had expected her to just give orders, not to get involved herself. One of them even suggests that the princess probably thinks the villagers are dirty, given her noble status. Just then, Commander Tristan shows up and smacks their heads, pointing to the princess. He asks if that looks like someone who thinks the villagers are beneath her. They see her playing with a little child and realize she is different. Commander Tristan explains that most nobles, when giving charity in the slums, only think of providing basic necessities like bread and milk. But people's needs go beyond just food. He adds that despite being raised in luxury, these knights have a worse understanding of the people than he does. Then he walks away, leaving them to reflect on their assumptions. As the distribution continues, someone calls out to Princess Llewellyn. When she turns around, she's shocked to see who it is. The man praises her for her good deeds, calling her a model for all nobles. He introduces himself as Ernal, the fourth patron who serves the Holy Father. Within the walls of his lavish estate, Duke Viserk is preoccupied with the words the princess shared about their night together. He can't help but wonder if she was merely acting or if there was truth behind her words. The possibility that it might be true is unsettling, and he finds himself spiraling into doubt and confusion. Meanwhile, Princess Llewellyn is seated in her elegant carriage, engaged in a conversation with the patron. 
she confesses that she expected him to be a stiff, mature cleric, not the youthful figure before her. Curious about his presence in the slums, she asks what brought him there. He explains that missionaries often visit disadvantaged areas to volunteer. When he heard that the princess would be there, he made it a point to come. He mentions that he was exploring the area and planned to go to Brigent before he saw her, attributing their encounter to divine luck. Throughout their conversation, she can't help but admire his striking platinum hair that shines like the sun, his fair skin, and his captivating purple eyes, reminiscent of amethysts. To her, he looks like an angel. The patron expresses his admiration for the princess, praising her compassion for the poor. He adds that if the royal family had more members like her, the people of their country would undoubtedly be happier. In a surprising turn, she reveals that she's considering relying on the gods, hinting at a desire to join the monastery. Shocked, he asks if she truly wants to take such a step, and she affirms. After a moment of contemplation, she questions if her decision is too rash, recalling her mother's dismissal from the church. She wonders if the patron, being from the Holy Kingdom, would be more sensitive to the issue of dark mages, but his response surprises her. He reassures her that he isn't afraid of the queen's past and would welcome her into the monastery. He goes on to say that a daughter redeeming her mother is a noble act, though he suggests that her situation might not be entirely wrong either. Perplexed by his words, she seeks clarification. Then, he explains that life in the monastery comes with numerous restrictions and controls, and that she might have been freer outside its walls. After he's done talking, he apologizes for making her uncomfortable with his words, but deep down the princess does not feel any bit of discomfort, rather she feels uplifted because it's been a long time since she's received someone's words of encouragement. As they arrive at the palace, the patron thanks her warmly for allowing him to ride with her and wishes her a safe journey back. She feels a wave of relief as she steps inside, grateful he hadn't noticed her mark. She can't help but wonder if it's because the mark no longer works. Just then, Tristan's voice cuts through her thoughts. He tells her that the knights will no longer escort her whenever she visits the Palace of Isolation, expressing deep concern for her safety. He even suggests creating a new discipline for the knights, clearly worried about her well-being. She turns to look at him, moved by his kindness. Despite being publicly insulted, Tristan not only fulfills his duty but also genuinely cares for her. However, she knows she can't let him get too close. She calls his name softly, pleading with him not to exceed the boundaries of her authority. She warns him not to assume he can say such things just because they've spoken privately a few times. Tristan looks taken aback but quickly apologizes, realizing he overstepped despite his good intentions. She enters her room, her mind swirling with thoughts, especially as she overhears the maid's secret conversations. On a beautiful day, everyone gathers at the monastery for Duke Viserk's blessing. While the patron leads the ceremony, Princess Llewellyn feels thankful that her mark has softened, hoping it will remain unnoticed. The patron continues his prayers for the duke, but then his eyes land on her. At that moment, she feels the familiar, oppressive sensation of the mark's dominance. Although she had believed the Asmodeus mark had vanished, she's shocked to realize it has been revived. King Bastion notices the princess's demeanor and asks if she's feeling unwell. He even suggests that she could leave first if she is. As the princess thinks to herself, she asserts that it's still just the beginning, so she's only at the level of blushing. However, she worries that if she can't control her feelings, she might lose control like the last time. The prayers for the duke continue, and after they are over, the princess looks into his eyes, accidentally causing her reaction to occur. This makes her wonder if she'll have to live with Asmodeus's slave seal for the rest of her life and spend her life in an unwanted relationship. These thoughts swirl in her mind as she turns around to walk away, prompting hushed whispers among the onlookers who question why she looks down on the duke who supported her. As she's about to leave, Duke Viserk strides up to her. He's visibly upset and points out that everyone is staring at him. He asks her how she can ignore him like this and reminds her that their relationship appears supportive to others and mentions that he has arranged a horse riding competition for her in a few days. 
she stops, spins around, and shouts that he shouldn't bother planning anything because it's pointless. She tells him to pretend he doesn't know her if he really wants to help. Inside, she's desperate to get back to her room because she can't handle the heat any longer. The Duke, taken aback, angrily accuses her of sleeping with the Captain of the Knights. She firmly tells him it's none of his business and all she wants is peace. She warns him not to follow her or come near her again but it's as if he doesn't hear her. He ignores her warning and steps even closer, insisting that she give him an order. With each step he takes, the mark on her body burns hotter. She tries to push him away, but he grabs her hand instead. Just as he's about to speak, he notices how feverish she is and asks if she's feeling alright. Despite her efforts to push him away, he holds her chin and tells her to look at him. She tries to stay calm, knowing where this could lead. Her hands rest on his shoulders, ready to act, but at that moment, the patron steps in. He sees them in their tense stance and jokingly asks if they're having a lover's quarrel. This causes her to retreat, and the patron adds that he thinks love isn't a bad thing and he likes it. Duke Weiser questions the patron's presence there because he thought he only came to bless him and then leave immediately. The patron apologizes for interrupting the lover's quarrel and reveals that he wants to visit the princess today. Surprised by the term lover's quarrel, Princess Llewellyn quickly denies being in a relationship with the Duke. In return, the patron requests that the princess should have a cup of tea with him, and, he mentions that he brought very fragrant tea leaves. Without hesitation, she accepts. As they arrive at the table to have the tea, he asks that she wait for a minute while he brings out the tea. As she awaits the tea, she ponders if it's because of the dark mark that this doesn't feel like usual. She also notices that his beauty is just enough and feels better than other beautiful ladies. Perhaps, if he's not a pastor but a commoner or an ordinary noble, then maybe he will also become the coordinator of the upper class. He returns to the table all smiley with the tea, and this sort of ignites her mark, but she tries to suppress it with a conversation. So, she questions his reason for wanting to see her, and to her surprise, he reveals that there's no special reason, only that he misses her face. She expresses her gladness seeing the blessing today. She reveals that it was the first time she saw pure and brilliant light which felt like a miracle of God. They converse for a while, and she jokingly shares that she's jealous of Duke Weiserk as regards to the blessing he received, and this leads the patron to ask if he should bless her too. He spills that he can decide to bless her as much as she wants, and she doesn't have to give a favor publicly to receive the protection of the Holy Kingdom. Baffled, she asks if his health will be okay after blessing her because from what she's learned before, no matter how excellent the patron is, after giving grace, he will not be able to develop his month of strength for a short period. He leans in, saying it's a little-known secret, but quickly adds that he's one of the most powerful patrons wielding holy magic. If anyone deserves a blessing, he's the one who can make it happen instantly. She thanks him, adding that she has nothing to offer in return. He steps closer, reassuring her that it's okay as long as he has the princess feelings for him. He urges her not to refuse and to accept the blessing, but his closeness makes her ask if the blessing needs to be done from such a short distance. He explains that he usually places his hand on the forehead, but, given her royal status, he can't ask her to kneel. He begins the process, but after a moment, something strange happens, her mark starts reacting, causing her to collapse to the ground. Concerned, the patron asks if she's okay. She replies that she's not feeling well and asks him to call a maid. In response, he questions if she knows about the seal of the devil and remarks that it's one of the advanced dark magics, specifically the Asmodeus power seal. He takes her hand, explaining that it's the curse of lust and that she must have intercourse with a man to break it. As he speaks, she inwardly battles the forces of the mark, having fantasies about him but quickly snapping back to reality, focused on escaping the situation. Suddenly, the patron offers to help, insisting that there's no need to find a maid since he can assist her himself. Princess Llewellyn stands frozen, her mind racing as she tries to decipher what the patron means by offering to help her. She catches the intent in his gaze and the horrifying realization hits her. She screams, rejecting the idea outright, 
unable to fathom such a thing with the patron. How could she ever consider it? The patron remains calm and asks if she truly understands her predicament. He explains that the blessing he gave her is clashing violently with the curse inside her, warning that if she leaves now, she will soon lose her sanity and act on animalistic instincts. Tears stream down Llewellyn's face as she demands to know why this is happening to her. She considers fleeing, but as she starts to rise, the patron grabs her hand, cautioning her that it would be extremely dangerous to leave now. Desperation tinges his voice as he tries to convince her to accept his help. He even goes as far as to reveal that, despite being a priest, he is capable of sleeping with women. Llewellyn screams in disbelief, horrified by the notion since priests are meant to remain pure. Seeing her shock, the patron decides to reveal a personal secret. He confesses that his father is the head of the Holy Kingdom and that, traditionally, a priest must remain pure for life. However, his father had a son, thus exempting him from this vow. He assures her that seeking his help is far safer than finding a stranger. Llewellyn, torn and overwhelmed, is about to speak when the cursed mark on her body flares up, causing her to collapse in pain. In her agony, she calls out his name and begs for his help. The patron pulls her close and kisses her, igniting an unexpected intimacy between them. He gently lifts her and carries her to the bed, where their connection deepens. Amidst their closeness, he muses that the Asmodeus curse isn't entirely bad, as it has led him to encounter such a beautiful girl like Princess Llewellyn. Much later after their moment together, he's seen patting her face with a towel because she went unconscious due to the curse. Then, a messenger comes to the room on the patron's demand, he seems baffled that the patron came to the kingdom just to hug a girl and he also mentions that he has slept with some women recently. The messenger inwardly remarks that if Lord Aaron knows about this, he'll be disappointed, however a thought crosses his mind. He says that patron Ernal normally doesn't stay with a girl after intimacy, but he's starting today, this makes him question the beauty of this particular girl. Without saying any words, the patron just stares at him and he immediately apologizes because he knows he has indeed belittled the warnings of the patron. Though the patron is very beautiful outside, his words are also elegant but he has caused the demise of many people and despite his angel face, he is the most devilish person. Suddenly, he starts to talk about the management of the apostates not being good and the messenger interprets the meaning of his words as a plan to start a massacre in the holy country. We're shocked to learn that there are many conflicts in the country because people don't accept patron Ernal, so the reason he comes there is to punish the people who don't follow him. Being that the patron only says cruel words, the messenger can't help but wonder how many people will lose their lives this time around. Princess Llewellyn wakes up, groggy and disoriented, wondering how she ended up back in her room. She hopes everything that happened yesterday was just a terrible dream. As she gets her bearings, she realizes that the intense desire she felt before is gone, and the curse's grip on her is much weaker now. The memory of being intimate with someone different strikes her, and she finds it odd yet strangely comforting. She can't shake the feeling that the patron is unusual. With her current focus on the Lord Patron, Llewellyn ponders the potential fallout. If any scandal arises, it will harm his reputation far more than hers, which she hopes will provide some cover. However, a rumor linking her to Duke Viserk would be disastrous. These thoughts swirl in her mind, leaving her wishing she had someone to confide in, but she feels utterly alone. Later that day, she joins the Patron for dinner. As they eat, she silently wishes he would leave her be, reminding herself that their intimate moment was purely a consequence of the curse. Her thoughts are interrupted when the patron speaks up, expressing his happiness and explaining that he wanted her to stay in his room until morning. However, he was concerned about her reputation, so he brought her back to her room instead. Let us know your thoughts on Princess Llewellyn's relationship with the patron. Also, please remember to like, share, and subscribe. See you in the next one.